Assembly will hear an address by His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, Emir of the State of Qatar. I request the protocol to, es to escort His Highness. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank and uh, on behalf of the, uh, of the General Assembly, I, uh, I have the honor to welcome uh, His Highness Sheikh uh, Tamim uh, bin, Ham, uh, bin Hamad Al Thani, Amir of State of Qatar, and invite him uh, to address the Assembly. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Your Excellency, President of the General Assembly, Your Excellency, Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to congratulate His Excellency Kasaba Kuroshi for assuming the presidency of the 77th session of the General Assembly. I wish him all success. I express our deepest appreciation to His Excellency Abdullah Shahid, the president of the 76th session, for his efforts. We highly value the efforts made by His Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, for his efforts to enhance the role of the UN and achieve its goals. Mr. President, our world has become a global village. Our issues, our concerns are intertwined. Our world has changed at an accelerated pace. The effects of any environmental incident, an economic crisis, a military confrontation reverberate globally. However, our approaches, our methods have not developed at the same pace to keep abreast of these revolutionary changes. Whether one believes that our world is unipolar or multipolar, global policy are still being managed according to the logic of uneven capacities and different interests and priorities, and not according to the logic of one humanity, one world. And I mean specifically that global crises are being managed based on narrow interests, based on the marginalization of international law, and relying on the balances of powers, not based on the Charter of the United Nations and the respect of states' sovereignty. We lack deterring mechanisms, and we are not able to punish those who violate sovereignty. The international community is unable to impose settlements when the stronger party rejects those settlements. In these circumstances, the behavior of world leaders, their wisdom comes to the fore, their commitment to justice in dealing with other countries. Mr. President, we are fully aware of the complexities of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and the international and global dimension to this crisis. However, we still call for an immediate ceasefire and uh, peaceful settlement because this is ultimately what will happen regardless of how long this conflict will go on for, perpetuating the crisis will not change this result. It will only increase the number of casualties and it will increase the disastrous repercussions on Europe, Russia and the global economy. On a different note, I don't think the representatives of the different countries present here need to be reminded that the Palestinian questions remains without solution. Failure to implement international resolutions and in light of the continuous change of the situation on the ground, the occupation and its settlement activities is pursuing a policy of fait accompli. This will change the rules of the conflict and will change the format of solidarity in the future. At this juncture, I stress that we stand in full solidarity with the brotherly Palestinian people in its aspiration to achieve justice. The Secu Security Council must shoulder its responsibility and must compel Israel to end the occupation of Palestinian territories and to establish a Palestinian state along the borders of 1967 with East Jerusalem as its capital. Remaining in our region, the international community was not able to hold war criminals in Syria accountable. What is even more disappointing is that some are trying to turn the page of the Syrian crisis 
ignoring the sacrifices, the significant sacrifices made by the blighted Syrian people without fulfilling its aspirations, without ensuring the unity of Syria and ensuring peace and security. The United Nations should not accept that the political track would be confined to the so-called Constitutional Committee under its auspices. The Syrian crisis has taught us a very important lesson about what can happen when the international community lacks a long-term vision in dealing with the suffering of people from unlimited injustice, destitution, and civil wars. Soon enough, accompanying a phenomena such as the refugees' issues become the problems that we actually have to focus on. We highly value the role played by countries that have hosted Syrian refugees, but we have to remind you that it is important to address the reasons for crisis before having to deal with repercussions of crisis. In Libya, we call for immediate measures at the global level to continue the political process and to agree on a constitutional basis for elections and to unify state institutions. We all are aware that it is impossible to restore the state without unifying military forces and without rehabilitating armed factions into one national army. Any party that rejects this solution must be renounced and held accountable. In Yemen, there is a glimmer of hope as parties have agreed to a temporary truce. We look forward to a comprehensive, durable ceasefire to pave the way for negotiations among Yemeni parties based on the outcomes of the National Dialogue and the GCC initiative, in addition to relevant Security Council resolutions, especially Resolution 2216. We hope national consensus would be achieved in Iraq, Lebanon and Sudan. Political elites must be up to the task so that citizens are able to achieve their aspirations. This would ensure the unity of the people, the unity of the nations, and ensure also that the diversity at the same time. This is not only possible, this is actually extremely realistic if there is will, if there is willingness to make concessions, to reach settlements, if the approach of quotas on ethnic grounds is abandoned, as this approach is rejected by young generations. Mr. President, we in Qatar believe in the need to achieve a just agreement on Iran's nuclear program that takes into account the concerns of all parties and that established a region free of nuclear weapons. A solution that also recognizes the right of the Iranian people to benefit from nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. There is no alternative to this agreement. This agreement would contribute to the stability and security of the region and will open the door for more dialogue and to achieving regional security. In Afghanistan, we call upon all parties to maintain the gains of the Doha peace process and build on it. That includes ensuring that Afghanistan does not become a safe haven for extremist terrorist groups. Only then the Afghani people would enjoy the long-awaited prosperity and stability. We have stressed time and again the importance of protecting civilians in Afghanistan and respecting human rights, including women's rights and the right of girls to education and achieving national reconciliation among all segments of Afghani society. We also warned against the isolation of Afghanistan as this can be counterproductive. Ladies and gentlemen, due to lack of global coordination and balanced planning of energy policies over many decades, we are now all facing an unprecedented energy crisis. Around a billion people around the world are living without a main reliable energy source. The crisis of the war in Ukraine might be new. However, having a political crisis turn into an energy crisis, that is not new. This situation has been exacerbating silently, even before the war in Ukraine. Decades of 
pressure to stop investing in fossil fuels, fuels before having sustainable alternatives, friendly, environmentally friendly and alternatives. That led to significant shortage in energy supplies. Of course, climate change and uh, the protection of the environment compel us all to diversify energy sources. But in the meantime, we still have to supply energy. We have to be realistic and we have to recognize that the future of energy will include a combination of different energy sources, such as solar energy, hydrogen, wind energy, and also hydrocarbons. as Qatar has continued to invest in liquefied natural gas for decades now. We have been able to expand the North Gas field. This will play a significant role in alleviating the energy crisis in many parts of the world. When it comes to basic commodities, such as energy, food and medication, exporters bear a very special responsibility that exceeds commercial responsibility. They must be reliable and they must respect agreements. Banning the transit of these commodities, banning their export or import during times of political crisis and imposing blockades on affected countries is not acceptable, just as it is not acceptable to use these commodities as tools of war, tools of conflict. They are not weapons. It is equally unacceptable to use water sources as if they were political tools. Mr. President, maybe the situation of the world today paints a very bleak picture of the future of humanity, but we believe in dialogue and joint action and all parties attempt to understand each other, putting ourselves in each other's shoes to see things from the other's perspective. Medium-sized and small countries are most in need of rules that govern international relations. Relying on major powers should not be a reason to abandon communication among each other. We all have a role to play. What appears today to be impossible will be a reality if we have the vision, the will and the good intentions. The approach pursued by Qatar is an approach that focuses on national development domestically and pursuing a foreign policy based on achieving a balance between principles and interests. We have also focused on being a mediator to settle disputes with peaceful means. We are aware of our responsibility as a source of energy and that or rather, we have proved to be a reliable partner. Qatar will welcome the world this year when we host the World Cup 2022. The challenge that has started 12 years ago required genuine resolve, considerable planning and hard work. And here we are today, ready to receive teams and spectators from all around the world. We're opening our doors in Doha to them without dim discrimination so that they can all enjoy the excitement so that they can all see with their own eyes the development that my country has achieved. The World Cup is being organized for the first time in a Muslim Arab country and the first time in the Middle East generally. The world will see that medium-sized and small countries are able to host global events with great success. Those countries are able to create an environment conducive to interaction among the peoples of the world. This event has already had a positive effect. Brotherly Arab nations have welcomed the so-called Haya card, which offers a visa to enter Qatar and also to enter other Arab countries. This card was welcomed by the public as well, and it has also incentivized Arab nations to look forward to a future where there are no barriers among the peoples. 
the Qatari people will open its arms to welcome football fans from all around the world. I quote the Holy Quran, we created you as races and tribes so that you can get to know each other, regardless of our different religions, our different ideologies, our duty is to overcome these barriers, to extend the hand of friends, to build friendship, to build the bridges of understanding. On behalf of my country, I invite you all to come to Qatar and to enjoy this unique World Cup. I welcome you all. May the peace, mercy and blessings of God be upon you. I wish to thank the Emir of the State of Qatar for his statement just made and I request the protocol to escort His Highness. The Assembly, we are here and addressed by...